how does sleep affect learning? Sleep before learning, sleep after learning, which are both fascinating kind of dynamics yeah. of the mind's interaction with this extra conscious state. Yeah, sleep is profoundly and very intimately related to your memory systems and your informational systems. Um, the first, as you just mentioned, is that sleep before learning will essentially prepare your brain um, almost like a dry sponge ready to sort of, you know, initially soak up new information. In other words, you need sleep before learning to effectively imprint information into the brain to lay down fresh memory traces. Um, and without sleep, the memory circuits of the brain, and we know we've studied these memory circuits, will, you know, they essentially become waterlogged, as it were, for the sponge analogy, and you can't absorb the information as effectively. So you need sleep before learning, but you also need sleep, unfortunately, after learning too, to then take those freshly minted memories and effectively hit the save button on them. But it's nowhere near as quick as a digital system. It takes hours because it's a physical biological change that happens at the level of brain cells. But sleep after learning will cement and solidify that new memory into the neural architecture of the brain, therefore making it less likely to be forgotten. So, you know, I often think of sleep in that way as um, it's almost sort of future proofing information <laughs> in, in, in what way? Brain. Well, it means that it gives it a higher degree of assurance f to be remembered in the mm. future rather than go through the sort of degradation that we think of as forgetting. So the brain has, in some ways by default, you know, it, there is forget. And, and actually I would love to, I was going to say sleep is relevant for memory in three different ways, but I'm going to amend that and say there's four different ways, which is learning, maintaining, memorizing, abstraction, assimilation, association, and then forgetting which oh, the last one sounds oxymoronic mm -hmm. based on the former three, but I'll see if I can explain. So sleep after learning then sort of, you know, sets the, that information like amber <laughs> um, in, you know, in, in solidification. The third benefit, however, is that sleep we've learned more recently is much more intelligent than we ever gave it credit for. Sleep doesn't simply just take individual memories and strengthen them. Sleep will then intelligently integrate and cross-link and associate that information together. And it's almost like informational alchemy. <laughs> so that you wake up the next morning with a revised mind-wide web mm. of associations. And that's probably the reason that, you know, you've never been told to stay awake on a problem. <laughs> you know, you, and in every language that I've inquired about that phrase or very something very similar seems to exist, which means to me that this creative associative benefit of sleep transcends cultural boundaries. It is a common experience across humanity. Um, <laughs> now, I should note that I think the French translation of that is much closer to, um, I think you sleep with a problem. Whereas the British, you know, you sleep on a problem. The French, you sleep with a problem. I think it says so much about the romantic difference between the, <laughs> the British and the French, but let's let's not go there. Um, <laughs> that's brilliant. So such a subtle, but such a fundamental difference. Yeah. Uh, oh, good, yeah, goodness me. Sleep with the problem. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. That's right, why I love the it. French. <laughs> um, so, and we can sort of double click on any one of these uh, and go in, into detail, but the fourth, I became really enchanted by about eight years ago in our research, which was this idea of forgetting. And I started to think that forgetting may be the price that we pay for remembering. Hmm. And in that sense, there is an enormous benefit to letting go. And you may be thinking, that sounds ridiculous. I don't want to forget. In fact, my biggest problem is I keep forgetting things. But the brain 
it has a fight well we believe has a finite storage capacity we can't prove it yet but my suspicion is that that's probably true it doesn't have an infinite storage capacity it has constraints mm -hmm. if that's the case we can't simply go through life being you know constantly informational aggregators unless you know we are programmed to say we've got a hard drive space of about 85 to 90 years and we're good and we can do that maybe that's true i don't think that's true i think forgetting is an incredibly good and useful thing so for example you know it's not beneficial from an evolutionary perspective for me to remember where i parked my car 3 years ago so it's important that i can remember today's parking spot but i don't want to have the junk kind of DNA from a memory perspective of, you know, where my I parked my car, you know, two years ago. Um, now, I actually have a, in some ways, a problem with forgetting I'm, and again, I'm not trying to sort of be laudatory, but, you know, I, I, I tend not to forget too many things. And I don't think that that's a good thing. And um, the, there was a wonderful um, neurologist, Luria, who wrote a book called The Mind of the Mnemonicist. And it was a brilliant book both because it was written exquisitely, but he was studying these sort of memory savants who basically could remember everything that he gave them. And he tried to find a chink in their armor. And the first half of the book is essentially about him seeing how far he can push them before they fail. And he never found that place. He could never find a place where they stopped remembering. Mm -hmm. And then in his brilliance, he turned the question on its head. He said, not what is the benefit of constantly remembering, but instead, what is the detriment to never forgetting? And when you start to realize his descriptions of those individuals, it's probably a life that you would not want. Mm -hmm. It's just fascinating, both from a human perspective, but also AI perspective. There's a, there's a big challenge in the machine learning community of how to build systems that are able to remember for prolonged periods of time, lifelong continuous learning. So where you build up information over time. So memory is one of the biggest open problems in, uh, in AI and machine learning. But at the same time, the right way to formulate memory is actually forgetting because you have to be exceptionally selective at which kind of stuff you remember. And that's where the step of a simulation integration that you're referring to is really important. I mean, we forget most of the things. And, and the question is exactly the cost of forgetting at the very edge of stuff that could be important or could not be. Mm -hmm. How do we remember or not those things? Like for example, I've, uh, you know, doing a podcast, I've become cognizant of one feature of my forgetting that's been problematic, which is I forget names and titles of books and so on. So when I read, I remember ideas. I remember quotes. Mm -hmm. I remember statements and like, that's the space in which I'm thinking. But when you communicate to others, you have to say, this person in this book said mm -hmm. that. So it's the same thing with, uh, with like Andrew Huberman is, is masterful at this. It's this important academia, remembering the authors of a paper and the title of the paper as part of remembering the idea. And I've been feeling the cost of not, not being able to naturally remember those things. And so that that's something I need to sort of work on. But that's an you example- good with faces? Yes, very good at faces. But not good with names. So I'm exactly like you. And there is you know, an understanding of that in the brain too. We understand that there is partitioning of those in terms of the territory of the brain that takes care of faces and facts and places and the, they can be separate. So I will never forget a face, but, you know, and as I said, I usually forget very little, but for some reason, names are a struggle. I think in some ways, because I'm probably just a slightly anxious person. So when yeah. you first meet someone, which is usually the time when a name is introduced, mm -hmm. you know, you were saying you were sort of anxious maybe about sort of sitting down with me, um, but I, I find that a little bit, you know, activating. And so it's not as though there's anything wrong with my memory. It's just 
the emotional state I'm in when I'm first meeting someone. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a little bit perturbing, but I will never forget their, their face. But um. I completely relate to that because I almost don't hear uh, people's names when they tell me because I'm so anxious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think there's certain quirks of social interaction that uh, show that you care about the person, that you remember that person, that they matter to you, that they had an impact on you. And one of the ways to show that is you remember their name. Yeah. And, but that's a quirk to me because there's um, a lot of people I meet have a, a deep impact on me, but they, I can't communicate that unless I know their name, unless I know some of the um, details that, that uh, we humans seem to use to communicate that we remember each other. What I, I remember well is the feeling we shared is the experience we shared. What I don't remember well is the detailed labels of, of those experiences. And I need to certainly work on that. I, I don't know. I think it's, you know, just allowing yourself to be innate and who you are is also a beautiful thing too. I, I'm not suggesting it's not important to try and better oneself. And, but I also sometimes worry about the misery that that puts us in. But like you, <laughs> yeah. I will, I, I do struggle with name, but I know for the first time when we met in the lobby, mm -hmm. um, I know exactly what you look like. I know that you were wearing headphones. I know the shape mm -hmm. and the size of those headphones. You didn't have your black jacket on. I know exactly what the weave of your shirt looked yeah. like. I know what your shoes look like. And I knew exactly the height of your, the end of your pants from the yeah. top of your shoes. Yeah. And so those things I don't forget, yeah. you know, and I can That's fascinating. remember when people, I met people, you know, two years ago and I'll say, oh yes, we met there. And um, I remember you had those fantastic, you know, boots on. I thought they were bloody great pair of boots, you know, yeah. and they're like, how do you, I didn't even remember what I was wearing that day. Yeah, yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah, I'm, I'm the exact the same way, but you can't, until we have Neuralink or something like that, we can't communicate that you remember all those things. I know, that's what I want. <laughs> so you have to be able to use uh, tricks of human communication for that. Yeah. But so that, I mean, th that's the, th it's ultimately is a trick of like, which to remember, which to forget. Right. And the forgetting is so, it's, it's so fascinating you say this. I mean, it seems to be deeply connected to that assimilation process. So forgetting, you try to fit all the new stuff into this big web of the old stuff and yeah. the things that don't fit, you throw out. I think the assimilation, the way I've been thinking about it with sleep, and it's particularly sort of dream sleep that we think can help with this assimilation, is that during wake, we have one version of associative processing. And what I mean by that is we see the most obvious connections. So I think of wakefulness as a Google search gone right. Mm -hmm. Whereas I see dream sleep as doing something very different. I think dream sleep is a little bit like group therapy for memories, that everyone gets a name badge mm -hmm. and sleep gathers in all of the individual pieces of the day. And it sort of starts to get you to, forces you in fact, to speak to the people, not at the front of the room that you think you've got the most mm -hmm. obvious connection with, but to speak with the people all the way at the back of the room that at first you think I've got no obvious connection with them at all. But once you get chatting with them, you learn that you do have a very distant, non-obvious connection, but it's still a connection non the same. And it's almost as though you're doing a Google search where you know I input you know Lex Friedman and it doesn't take me to the first page of your home site. Page 20. It takes me to page 20, <laughs> which is about some like field hockey game yeah, in Utah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Now it turns out that there actually is a link if I look at it. It's a yeah. distant, non-obvious one. And to me, I find that exciting because when you fuse things together that shouldn't normally go together, but when they do, they cause marked advances in evolutionary fitness. It sounds like the biological basis of creativity. And that's exactly what I think dream sleep and the algorithm of dream sleep is designed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a Boolean like system where you have, you know, the sort of assumptions of true and false, you know, maybe it's more fuzzy logic system. And I think REM sleep is a perfect environment within which we do, you know, it's, it's almost like memory pinball. You know, you get the information that you've learned during the day and then you pull the lever back and you shoot it up into the attic of your brain 
you know, this cortex filled with all of your past historical knowledge, and you start to bounce it around and see where one of those things lights up, and you build a new connection there, and you build another one there too. You're developing schemas. And so in that way, I think you could argue, you know, we dream, therefore we are.